Reading is Luke chapter 8 and starting at verse 26. Um, it's page 1037 in the Church Bibles. So Luke 8, starting at verse 26. They sailed to the region of the Ranges, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stopped, stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs were feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let him go into the pigs and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man with whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Ramses asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got up into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went and told all the town how much Jesus had done for him. And the title of this morning's sermon is Of Sound Mind. Now we hear a, a, a lot today of, of mental illness and the struggles that people have faced through the pandemic. Um, it does not surprise us that being locked away from one another and uh, being unable to do things socially with friends and family is going to have an effect on us as it's going to change uh, the way that we deal uh, and we have seen that haven't we the way that people deal with crowds so aren't quite so keen to be back in crowds these days and that's not just to do with the fact that we're still nervous of covid going around but we've not been used to that kind of thing and it takes us a little bit of getting over doesn't it now we welcome anything, don't we, that helps people um, to get the help that they need, uh, that they need to receive to, to be, get beyond that. We, however, must not forget that our needs are not always what we might think. Sometimes uh, those mental struggles point to bigger spiritual issues. And in our day, they often go undealt with because it's not the thing to do, to speak about things in a spiritual uh, dimension and certainly it is unwise or, or very frowned upon to think about the surgeon of souls the Lord Jesus Christ himself he really doesn't get much press when it comes to some of the struggles that people have the doctor that we truly need is not allowed to even comment well in today's passage it's clear that all the help that was available for this man was not enough he was a broken man he was broken in many ways and we'll look at that in just a moment a man who had exhausted all human help and was still in a mess uh, what was he to do so let's have a think about that man that broken man that comes in verses 26 to 31 and there are in reality uh, of course uh, varying degrees of brokenness in people's lives aren't there some brokenness comes about through past trauma. Something has happened in someone's past and it really uh, swamps the whole of their life. They can't get beyond it. 
Um, and everything that they do is referred back to that one event that took place in their life and, and really bothers them and uh, stops them moving forward. Uh, some uh, really struggle or have degrees of brokenness through family instability. Uh, you know, we discover that um, it's really not popular, isn't it? One man, one woman together for life. That's not really the way of doing things in this day. Yet nobody will speak about the brokenness that comes from that. Um, as, you know, if uh, at least uh, when people do get married, they're often getting divorced within a very short space of time. And the trauma that that uh, brings about in, in youngsters' lives because uh, of that split up. And, and very other degrees of inst family instability uh, are there. Some others through poor education. Um, they have not been taught what they need to be taught and so struggle in life uh, from that uh, way onwards. And then there are those that uh, really bring about self-inflicted brokenness, don't they? They get involved in all kinds of things that, uh, uh, that bring their life to a point in which they struggle to move forward or they're locked into something. Well, none of all of this takes God by surprise. He's not surprised by any of this. He, he understands and knows what's going on in this world. And he has already made an assessment of this world. Even the best of humanity is included in this assessment. But it's not a popular assessment. Uh, this is what God says as he looks around this world. Romans chapter 3, um, and he's quoting some Old Testament uh, verses, but this is what it says. Romans 3, 10 to 18. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Uh, there is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God in their eyes. Well, that's a damning report, isn't it? Uh, you know, you get your children's uh, report, their teachers send home a report every now and again, and you look at it, and, uh, and uh, these days, uh, certainly through Arnwood, you're, you're marked in ones, twos, and threes, and, uh, and if you're in the threes category, you're in desperate state, so you need to get back into the ones and twos. Um, uh, you know, and we sort of think that's bad enough. But here is God. He looks at this world and he sees all of the brokenness and he's not taken in by the apparent goodness that is there. He sees it and it truly is a mess, desperate mess that is in need of a desperate cure. So each of us is broken to one degree or another and we get used to it, don't we? That's the problem. We get used to our brokenness. Um, what bothers us or makes us unsettled is when we find a life that is broken beyond the norm. That really upsets us, doesn't it? That really gets under our skin. You know, most of us carry on our lives and there is sin and there are problems and there are difficulties, but that's largely the norm. And then we meet someone who really just challenges what we, what we deem to be the norm. And it gets under our skin. And here we are in this passage meeting someone who is in that stage of his life. He is in that place in his life that he is so broken that all of society around him just can't deal with it. He's actually out of control. We see that in verse 27. He's, he's running around naked. Now that would throw us a little bit, wouldn't it? Um, but he's running around naked. He's living in tombs. So he doesn't even have a house to go to. He's not cared for in any way. I suspect he looked dirty and filthy. He's violent, and the local population wants to lock him up. You know, we, we can't deal with him. He is just too much of a problem. He can't even control his speech. If, if you look in the text, he's literally shouting at the top of his lungs at Jesus, who is, I suspect, speaking to him fairly gently. He is shouting at the top of his lungs. He's dialed right up. Uh, and he doesn't seem to be able to come back down from that. Now, those things tell us that he is in a mess. Uh, they tell us that 
Certainly, mentally speaking, he has issues. He has some quite serious ones. They tell us that some things are not easily fixed. And those things on their own are bad enough. And we have all probably at some time or another seen people are in similar or or bad uh, situations like that. Uh, And it it takes us back. Uh, We don't quite know how to deal with it. and We uh, sort of try and avoid them. Um, we go the long way around, don't we? If, if we see them in the street and they're, and they're causing a scene, we just don't want to get in, involved. However, this man is more out of control even than those that we see on the street in that way. He is, we are told, possessed by demons. Well, in our 21st century thinking, uh, we automatically like to, at this point, say that back then, in Jesus' day, You know, they simply just didn't understand mental illness. And it was easier to take the kind of superstitious um, route and to put it down to something supernatural that you couldn't get a hold of. And, and, And that's what we tend to like to do in our 21st century sensibilities. We don't like to think, or certainly the world at large doesn't like to think, that there is anything going on in the spiritual world at all. And to have a man who might be possessed by the devil in some way, well, that fills us with a great deal of fear, doesn't it? It's terrifying. And so here is this man. He is really beyond the pale. There's there's nothing that can be done for him, and and that's been shown um, by the way that the people have treated him. But, you know, I think we should perhaps rethink, shouldn't we, in the light of recent years and the the resurgence of occult practice, uh, the rise of witchcraft, and the general dabbling in things that people do not understand, I think we need to be very aware that there are spiritual things going on in this world and that the devil is very much at work. We kind of go to one of two extremes, I think, is the reality. We either take the kind of African view, which is that the devil is behind every problem uh, and that everybody is demon-possessed, or we take the view that is... Perhaps our more cultured view, we're, we can't have that in our day, can we? You know, we're far, far too sanitised for that kind of a, of a life. And, but I think we need to wake up to the fact that there are spiritual realities, that there are people who, while they have been so involved in things that they shouldn't have been, that the devil has taken control. That he or his minions are there doing their work. We understand how drugs get hold of people's lives, don't we? And it saddens us, doesn't it, when we see someone who is addicted to drugs. And we know that addictions are hard to beat, so whether that's drugs or or pornography or uh, gambling or all manner, whole loads of things that we can get addicted to, uh, we can kind of see how that might mess someone up. But what we fail to understand is that the devil is behind all of that, And the further that we sink our lives into those things, the more we open ourselves up to evil things and even to evil spirits. Because of the last 500 years of Christian influence in this country, we have been lulled into a false sense of security when it comes to the spiritual realm. At some point in this man's life, he, instead of seeking God for help, he dabbled in something that he shouldn't. He opened himself up to that devil's influence and, uh, until he was fully overtaken by evil. And in fact, we can see by the text that this man has clearly just laid his whole life open to that which is evil. He's not possessed just by one spirit. Uh, the number is not given to us. We're told it's a legion. Well, I'm told that a legion could be anywhere between 3,000 and 6,000. Now, I don't think necessarily that that's telling us that he had 3,000 to 6,000 demons. I think that's just telling us that there's a large number. And he is, well, in a mess. At the very least, we need to say, as we think about this, and as we see this man out of control, we need to say that we need to be very careful about what influences us, don't we? It's rather too easy, isn't it, to sit down in your living room, put the TV on, and just allow the world to feed you. Allow the devil, because he's out there at work in the world, 
to tell you what your priorities, are, what the things that you should think about are. And so we need to be careful. But we need to be wise about the things that we watch. Because it might begin harmless. It might seem all innocent. But you know that's the way the devil works. Very rarely will the devil ever come to you and give you something which, you, which he knows that you cannot stand or that you know is evil. He will come to you with something nice. Well, that doesn't matter. I, you know, it's harmless if I watch this. It's, it doesn't contain anything that bad. And, and the problem is, once that barrier has been broken, well, it's not long before you're on to the next one. And before you know it, you're watching and taking in things and you're becoming part of a world and a life which is anything but honouring to Christ. He's also isolated, verses 27 through to 20 and verse 29. And not only is he out of control, um, but he is also isolated. That is both a mixture of his community pushing him out, but also of the recognition that he doesn't fit. Uh, you know, we isolate ourselves when we discover that no one is quite like us. We stay away. But also there is that sense in which the community can't deal with him, so he's being pushed out. And isolation is a bad thing in many contexts. But most particularly, it's bad if you have problems. It, it, if you have problems and you isolate yourself, uh, then what happens is those problems get worse. And you get in, go in a downward spiral, don't you? You become depressed or despondent, uh, it saps your will to resist, and eventually the whole problems crush you. And in this man's case, he probably sought seclusion because of the many noises in his head. The many voices that he's hearing. We also discover that he's bound in verse 29. Now we can see that this man is physically restrained. He has literal chains, but also there were the internal chains. This man could not do what he wanted to do. He was forced by all that was going on in him to do whatever was their pleasure. He'd literally given over the running of his life for someone else. And here this man actually provides us an excellent picture of sin at work. Of sin at work in a person's life. If we all think that that we are in control of our lives and that we have the ability to choose what to, what we do, to, to do um, good or evil, don't we? We kind of think that that's where we're at. But actually, the Bible says in our natural state, we rather like this man, our sin compels us. Now, we might not be indwelt by a devil, but there is something in us that is prone to doing the wrong thing. You may have noticed that in your life. You know, it's far easier to do the wrong thing than it is to do the right thing. Often doing the right thing comes at an expense that we're not prepared to, to pay. And sin grabs a hold of our life and it compels us to, to, know, uh, to do things that we know aren't right. And though we might fight it, have you noticed that you never actually win the battle? You know, we might try and resist for a while, but eventually it gets the better of us. And we, like this man, need to be set free. Uh, we need to have that which binds us removed. He's also lost, verse 30. Lastly, we see this man is lost. His identity has is so far gone that he's just one of the many inhabiting his life. So uh, when Jesus asks him his name, he comes back with a description. My name is Legion. I'm fairly sure that his mum never gave him the name Legion. Okay. Here he is. He's just lost. There is so much going on in him that he doesn't know where he begins and those evil spirits take over. He's just caught up in the midst of it. Now, you might not be here this morning battling demons, but you might be just as lost as he was. 
So many voices in this world that you're listening to, so many competing for your soul that you no longer know who you are. And you may feel totally lost. Completely at sea. Who am I? It's a huge question, isn't it? And we see people around us wrestling with that day after day. I'm just not sure who I am. You, you know, what is me? And people are then begin to make their identity around their sexual persuasion. Their identity around the job that they do. Their identity about the good works that they're involved in. Because they just don't know who they are. They're lost. Well, this is where the next man comes in. Uh, so we've had a, a man who is um, in, in a mess, a broken man. But there is also a unique man in the story, isn't there? In the, in the, uh, in the account that's given to us. I was careful when I say story. Um, this isn't a story. This is an account of what Jesus has done. As a unique man, verses 26 to 37. Uh, Jesus is now on the case. This man, messed up as he is, is in Jesus' sight. But just who is this Jesus and what can he do? Well, the first thing we discover in the text is that actually the demons recognize him. That comes in verse 28. Uh, they cry out, Jesus, uh, to Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. And now it could have been that these demons were wanting to, at this point, get people scoffing at Jesus. You know, the crowd is watching on. Uh, let's, uh, you know, let's make fun of Jesus. It could be that that's what they were trying to do. Because let's face it, demons weren't going to want to work with Jesus. But whatever their motive for calling out Jesus at, at that particular point, they are perfectly right as to who he is. They've seen it. <laughs> It's quite telling when you realise that just before this point, the disciples had no clue as to who Jesus was. At verse 25, you remember we spoke of it um, a few weeks ago. This understanding, or was it last week? It might even be last week, it tells you how good my brain is. Um, it, last week, these disciples who were in the boat with him couldn't see who Jesus was. And yet here are these demons who have met Jesus for about 30 seconds. And they already know exactly who he is. That tells us something. These demons knew within seconds. The devil and his crew know who Jesus is. They just don't want others to know who Jesus is. So if you want to know what the devil is up to in this world, he is convincing you that Jesus doesn't matter. He's convincing that you can write him off either as a madman or you can simply dismiss him as though he was never there. That's what he wants to do and he will do whatever it takes to get that done. So, although there are many very evil things in this world, the actual real work of the devil is to blind the eyes of unbelievers so that they cannot see Jesus, and he will fill your life with whatever it takes. Amusement, entertainment, work, family. Anything and everything is fair game for the devil, so long as he can stop you seeing who Jesus is. When you know who Jesus is, the game is up. Uh, the devil loses his control. Uh, and the demons not only see, recognize him, but they also obey him, we discover in verses 31 to 33. Uh, we are here seeing uh, what normally takes place in the spirit realm. These demons know Jesus. They are trembling before him. Now, you would think sometimes, the way that Christians speak, that the devil is as powerful as God. And nothing could be further from the truth. The devil cowers before 
Jesus. Sometimes we're, we're, we're deluded into thinking that there's somehow some kind of standoff between two similar uh, opponents and nothing could be further from the truth. These demons, though they did not want to obey, will obey because they have no other choice. The King of Kings stands before them and he's telling them what they should do. They even try begging to get some concession out of Christ. You notice that in the text, you know? I don't let us go into the abyss. I let us go into the pigs. It's a far better option. Well, these de demons, even before Jesus goes to the cross, know that they are a defeated enemy. They know that their time is limited. They know that the end is in sight. In fact, if you go to Jude, chapter six, uh, Jude, verse 6, I was getting... There aren't any chapters in Jude, only the one. Um, so Jude 6, this is what it says. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So there is a sense in which there are some already chained up. There are some that are free roaming this world. But ultimately, they're all going to be judged. They're all going to be thrown into the abyss. And at this moment, these demons, as they face with Jesus, suddenly are saying, well, is that time come already? What they are scared of is that judgment time has come. The fact that demons are afraid of Christ should teach us to do all that we can to, a being in, uh, to avoid being sucked into their world. And their world is the world of lies and deceit. The devil is the father of lies, and that's all he spreads everywhere. If we will not heed Christ, we will share their end. But that's the reality. And now we all like to think that demons will get their just desserts. There's none of us here that think demons are great. And we're all happy to accept that they will one day be punished eternally. But here is the thing. If you side with them, them in this life, you will meet their end. You will face their judgment. <clears throat> uh, Jude carries on. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict them all of all the ungodly acts that have been committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You're either on one side or the other today. You either are trusting Christ for your salvation, for the forgiveness of your sin, or you are sat in the camp of the devil. There's no middle ground. Uh, there's no fence to sit on. It's one or the other. We also see he has the power to transform. That comes in verses 35 to 36. This man, whose life was such a mess, who was controlled by demons, uh, whom the town had rejected, is brought face to face with Jesus Christ. And Jesus simply commands the demons out and fully restores this man's life. It takes a word. Now if this was anyone other than Jesus, it would be worth sp spending time analysing the miracle and wondering how it could be done. This, however, is Jesus Christ. He is God in human flesh. He is the one who hung the stars in space. He is the one who sustains this universe. Uh, what Jesus has done is fully in line with who Jesus is. And that's what you need to get. He's the Son of God. He is the King of Kings. He is the creator of the universe. And if he wishes to manipulate this world and do miracles, it is well within his powers. We don't need to explain them away. We just need to understand who he is. Uh, 
as Jesus is in the area that would have been predominantly Gentile, uh, the pandemonium about the pigs simply added to the publicity of what Jesus is doing. People have tried to find all sorts of meanings in the pigs and why the pigs, why the demons wanted to go into the pigs. Well, let's face it, it's probably the biggest publicity stunt that Jesus has done in the sense that here he is in, in, in a community that aren't going to take him seriously. They, they have no interest in the things of, of Jewish history, as it were, because they're predominantly Gentile. And so he does something that makes the whole town sit up and take note. Now, I feel a little sorry for the pig farmer. 2,000 pigs gone at a blink of an eye. But this is Jesus. He's in sovereign control, isn't he? Don't we have clauses in our insurance? An act of God? The man is in his right mind. He is clothed. And you know, get this, this is the wonderful thing. He is now learning from Jesus. He has sat at the feet of Jesus. That's just an understanding that he has become one of Jesus' disciples. And I suspect in the time it took for all the town to come out and see what was going on, Jesus spent quite a little time with this man explaining to him the things of Christ, the things of himself. This is a truly magnificent, miraculous event. And before you write this off and think, well, that's wonderful, but what, what about my messed up life? Jesus came into this world not simply to do miraculous healing. In fact, all his healing simply confirmed who he was and highlighted the message that he was sharing. He came to bring lost, bound, lonely, and those without control to be saved and added into his family. So that's every one of us, isn't it? This morning, every one of us can be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't given your life to him, now's the time to do it. Don't wait. If you recognise that there's sin in your life and it's a problem, confess your sin to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive you. He will make you right. And as we meet him here, he's on his journey to the cross. He will go to the cross as the sacrifice for sin to make atonement for us. And on that cross, he will give his life in your pay, place to pay your sin penalty. And having paid it, he would be raised to life. To show that his sacrifice on your behalf was acceptable. Why did Jesus have to rise from the dead? You shouldn't take us by surprise, he's God. But why did it have to happen? In order that we might understand that his death achieved everything that he set forth to do. By faith in his death and his resurrection, you will be made new. And then we have the last man, is the change man. He's in verse 35 to 39. The locals are not happy with Jesus. He's responsible for the death of 2,000 pigs. And worse than that, he's done something to this man that they cannot explain. You know, they've been dealing with this man for years and not been able to get him under control. This one man shows up and everything is altered. What do you do with someone who scares you in that way? <laughs> well, they do exactly with Jesus what they did with the man with the demons. They send him away. Oh, this is beyond our understanding. This is beyond our comprehension. Go. And our friend here in the passage simply wants to go with Jesus. You know, that's quite a normal desire, isn't it? Jesus comes into your life. He changes and transforms. You want to go with Jesus. <laughs> Wherever he's going, I'm following. No? After all, he doesn't have a real home, um, and the life in his town was virtually non-existent. You know, he's got nothing keeping him there. 
And the thought of going with Jesus is very appealing, isn't it? But Jesus will have none of it. The difficulty that we, we have with the Bible account is that it never gives us the detail we feel that we would like. While he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, what did he teach him? That's what we want to know, don't we? You know, while he was there, in order for this man to be effective in, in telling others about Jesus, what did he learn sat at his feet? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us. What it wants us to do is to draw the, the conclusion that the moment that you meet with Jesus, that he begins to teach you things that you can tell others. And I'm going to guess he didn't have so long, he didn't have all the ins and outs of the gospel that we know, largely because a lot of it hadn't actually happened at that point. But what he did know is that he could trust Christ and that Christ had changed everything. way of salvation, the matters of the kingdom. He was to stay and share it with his fellow townsmen. Now, whilst they may not give Jesus a hearing, no one in the town would be able to refute the testimony of this man. They saw what he was like, and they saw how Jesus transformed him. Jesus Christ had literally given him a sound mind. He had restored to him his future and he had given him hope. That's all most people in life want, isn't it? Jesus Christ was his reason for living. He was now free from bondage. He was lost, but now he'd been found. He was out of control, but now he knew what self-control looked like. And surely that's the testimony of every person that comes to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? So every one of us here this morning, if we know Christ, and tell others about the Christ that is declared in the Gospels. Don't get hung up on the demons and the miracles. Wonderful though they are, not the demons, the miracles. <coughs> Don't get hung up on those. Get hung up on who Christ is. Because he changes everything. Let's pray, shall we? Uh, loving Heavenly Father, as we've been going through Luke, we've seen the way that when Jesus met people, he radically changed their lives. We pray, uh, Lord Jesus, that you would radically change ours. Uh, that we might live in this world and that we might show to this world, not ourselves, uh, not wonderful, miraculous things, but that we would show them Christ. And Lord, if you're pleased to do miraculous things in the midst of that, hallelujah. But Lord, help us to be centred entirely upon the Lord Jesus Christ, on who he is, on what he can do, on what he has done, and what he will do. Lord, fill us with a greater vision of our precious Saviour, we ask. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. <coughs>